Hello to everyone watching and thanks for tuning in today. I'm Assemblywoman Megan Daly representing the First Assembly District, which encompasses the northeastern corner of California, nine counties, 25,000 square miles. I hope everyone is watching as well and safe. And I know that it's been difficult to stay positive and think about the future and how we'll continue on a normal basis after this pandemic has passed. That's why I wanted to start highlighting the great work that's happening through eight, throughout 81 and share with you some information and different members of our community. Today, we are joined by my very dear friend, Cliff Munson, on behalf of the Siskiyou Golden Fair. Hello, Cliff. Hey, hello, Megan. <laughs> We're so glad to see each other's face. We haven't seen yep. each other's face for a while. That's um, right. So, Cliff has quite the bio. Cliff Munson has been the CEO at the Siskiyou Golden Fair since 2010. He also serves as the chairman of the 2020 Western Fairs Association Board and several other state committees and associations relating to fairs and the agricultural industry. Cliff is here to speak to the, to the state of our fairs and answer some important questions regarding what we can expect in the coming months as we enter fair season. So thank you so much, Cliff, for joining us today and you and I have um, a few questions that we've laid out for just a groundwork, basically, and then we'll kind of add as we go. But um, I think all of us are very interested in what the state of our fairs are, given the current COVID crisis and what that's going to mean. We value our fairs. All of our community members value our fairs um, very much. So what do you think about the current state? Well, I can just tell you, of course, we're, um, we're in crisis mode again. Um, as you know, um, the California Air Network has, has been called upon by the governor to assist. And this has been going on for, for many years. We, you know, we are called to assist in terms of all kinds of emergencies, whether it's a fire or a flood or the Oroville Dam uh, episode we had a few years ago. Fairgrounds are always on the front line of, of providing uh, in those situations. And, and Megan, I'm gonna start off just, uh, just to, to say, yes, we talk about fairs. And so just so we are um, completely on the same page, you know, we are fairgrounds. We're year round uh, facilities that are used for all kinds of things. So when we talk about the overall structure and the actual real property were fairgrounds. When you're talking about the five-day event that communities gather for, those are our fairs. So I will try to keep on that, you know, keep that as part of it. So at this time, you know, we, we are having, just like probably you are every day, um, many, many conference calls daily to discuss all the things that are going on in fairs across California. We have been called upon you know, to provide emergency services at this time. So there's many fairgrounds. We have hospitals, uh, emergency hospitals set up on fairgrounds in California. Uh, we have everything from uh, testing sites to uh, uh, food pantry type situations where they're centralizing food. Uh, a lot of different things are going on at fairgrounds. Along with, of course, as you started into the fall and into this time of year, you know that we were tasked with also uh, helping with the homeless situation and there's fairgrounds that have FEMA trailers already on them and now I understand that they're moving folks who have recovered from COVID-19 into these uh, FEMA trailers that are now on fairgrounds. So fairgrounds are very important not only in this situation but we, we try to assist uh, you know for every situation that we're called upon to help with. You know in 2011 we were uh, California was suffering a debilitating fiscal crisis. Uh, looking at where we're at today, it could be very similar going ahead here. And, but the, the situation is this. All California fairgrounds were tasked with surviving without any funding in 2011. We have been working for several years. We had AB 1499 mm -hmm. that was signed by the governor in 2017. Uh, we still have not actually got those funds to fairgrounds. Uh, we've been working, you know, with the, with the state, with CDFA, with uh, the Department of Finance to get those funds out. We're, 
at this time, just because we're in a, an emergency situation, those funds are now rolling out as we speak. That is only about, and it sounds like a lot, but really when you look at the, the fact that we have been tasked with surviving on our own. So we've built up all these interim events to host at fairgrounds, which are how we've been earning our own money to keep ourselves alive. This $150,000 will only last most fairgrounds, maybe two or three months. So at the end of the two or three months, the amount of, of monies that we have lost from our interim events will be helped, you know, just to pay salaries and whatnot to keep us open in case of emergencies. And so I would tell you our outlook right now is pretty grim. And, and we are, you know, keeping, you know, we're staying as positive as we can. And, and we are working on this daily with uh, state officials to try to see what we're going to have to do to be able to continue to serve our communities. Well, that moves into another question that I had as far as what can a call to action, I mean, we're kind of jumping ahead a little bit, but since we're talking about that, yes. what is something as a community member, or I know I've written letters, we'll continue. Obviously we're completely committed to fairs and receiving their funding, but what can we do as in a call to action I mean, yes, people can write me a letter and say we need our fares and we value them and they're important. I just want everyone to know that I am, I'm on that as, a, as your assembly member. So what can people do? Well, I, I'm, I'm just going to say this, and I know that there is going to be a lot of emergency situations in our state. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I know that... Uh, in the past, in the, in the fiscal crisis of 2011, uh, there was no other entity in California that was funded by government funds that was 100%, had 100% of their funding eliminated besides fares. At that time, we reduced staff as much as we could. We had to to survive. And, and because we have not gained any funding back, most fares have never recovered from that yet. So we are already at minimum staffing levels. And, you know, the first thing you would say is, well, maybe you need to start laying people off again. But in reality, Megan, there is nobody to lay off. That is the truth of the matter if we're going to be here to serve the community. So um, I know that it's going to be, there's going to be a lot of, uh, California is going to be different than we've ever seen it before. There's going to be legislation from legislators like yourself and Brian that are, that are gonna be addressing this in a lot of different places, whether it's a local hospital or it's, it's education because of the whole mess up in education. But I just hope that this time when that is all brought forth that they remember that fairs are important and that they use us uh, a lot in a lot of different situations. And we're not just that five day fair where everybody comes and shares the culture and the pride of a community. We are here year round serving our community. So and so as far as letters, I mean, I think that there's gonna be so many people that are, that are hurting and, and in need and, it's, and there's gonna be a lot of us that are at emergency levels that are gonna have to have some support from the state. And I don't know what that's going to look like. It could be federal support, uh, similar to the $2 trillion, uh, you know, boost for COVID-19. But some, in some way, we're going to have to make sure that some of that money funnels down to the fair industry. Yeah. And so you touched on a little bit, but I'd like to expand on what, the, what fairs play a role in, specifically in like emergency response, disasters and catastrophic events. I know that your fair has been a fire camp uh, yeah, we have been a fire camp. We've been an emergency shelter. Uh, most every winter, we're in a very unique position here in Wairika, where if you go north of us, you go over the Siskiyous. You go south of us, you go down through the canyon, down through Dunsmere, down to Redding. When we get normal winter snowstorms, the freeway gets closed in Dunsmere and going over the Siskiyous. Mm -hmm. And all the people that are trapped within our region right here all end up at the fairgrounds if they can't find shelter at a hotel or something like that. So many, many times we've been opened up in the winter, 
we're a fire camp in the summer, we can uh, have to work with Red Cross and the Office of Emergency Services to provide shelter. We've been animal rescue shelter during fires. The Hornbrook fire a couple of years ago, they were hauling animals in here uh, right and left until you know our facility got to be pretty full. So um, we've helped out going south, north, every direction from us, you know, over time. And and there's many other things that we do here in Siskiyou County. We have a uh, county drive-through flu shot clinic, and that's you know they we have that all set up to happen right here at the fairgrounds. Uh, if there was a need to vaccinate for a pandemic, that would run right here out of the fairgrounds. So if there was a vaccine, let's say for the COVID-19, and they tried to shuffle people in the county through a vaccine line, it would be done right here at the fairgrounds. So during those um, events, do you receive additional funding for those? Well, um, fire camps, we are reimbursed by either the federal government or CAL FIRE. But uh, when you get into a situation like a Office of Emergency Services situation and the Red Cross and the Red Cross becomes involved, you really, uh, you might, you get reimbursed partially for the services rendered in terms of electricity, the toilet mm -hmm. paper they use, whatever like that. But you do not get uh, reimbursed for the use of your buildings or anything like that. So really when they take over and they're here, it not only eliminates your interim rentals because the facility is being used for an emergency. So you're not making money on the building. And of course you're providing a service every single day. All right. And, and I think that's, have the payroll of your maintenance and your crews that are still coming in and that's exactly to take care right. of your, build, your buildings. And I know that capital improvements for fairgrounds have long, long since been set aside. You and I have had those discussions about, you know, the fire well, marshal and how right. the upgrades and things that you need to do to your buildings and the funding is just not available. Well, and, and it's just not, you know, you're just, it isn't here yet. And it's, I know that it has it has come to the limelight here recently, and the governor actually in his budget had a line item put in there for fairground uh, maintenance uh, and you know improvement, and it was like 180 million dollars. Not saying that we were going to get the funding, he at least put it in there saying it was something he would like to start working on, and I know that you know that's going to be uh, probably not uh, a viable option in in 2020-21. Right, but as we move forward, it is it's very um, clear that fairgrounds are used for much more than, like you said, the week the week long event that we all look so look forward to. But they and are really year round. No, we really are year round facilities, and we have we have built that infrastructure even more so with the defunding, making sure that we can get as many much of our community and as many people onto our fairgrounds using it in many different ways. You know, uh, it, it, I know that we're going to talk about that. And, and when you see how many times a year, even a fairground like ours that's in a very remote and a, and a, north, a northern uh, place where, you know, you have five months of winter where you really can't use the facility because it's frozen up and snowed in, you know, just how much you do get used. It's amazing. So with your role on the Western Fair Board, um, how are fairs coming together, to, uh, you know, working together? And I don't, I don't even know the number of fairs that we have in the state. Do you have that? Well, there are 78 uh, fairs and, you know, there are district ag associations, county fairs. We have citrus festivals and we have the 501c nonprofit fairs that are run by a board, uh, mm -hmm. a nonprofit board. And there's 78 of us. I think there's like 76 fairgrounds. There's two fairs that uh, don't even have their own fairground, but they are still operating. Uh, one of those is Sacramento, and the other is the uh, Southern County, uh, Southern California Fair. I'm trying to think; it might be the Southern California Fair, but anyway, those two fairs don't have a fairground, so they utilize some other means to have a fair. So they're not talking about real property in that situation. But between the 54 DAs and then, of course, the remainder are county fairs. You know, we have real property that we're talking about. It's not a situation where. Uh, state leadership looks at us like we're, um, you know, another situation where they don't have real property that they have to deal with. They, they you, you know, the state actually owns this property and, 
And it's been our contention for several years, you know, that if it's state property, yes, the community should be responsible for keeping it viable in terms of usage and, and that fact that we earn enough money that we can pay the salaries of the people are here and, you know, it's a viable operation, but really the investment in the buildings and the upkeep should be, you know, paid for in, by some other means. Your, 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 the usage is by the state. So we, we hope that at some point we can come to that. Well, we definitely will be working with you and the um, Western Affairs Association to continue to chase this money and try to get it to down to the fairs. Something that um, has come up quite a bit in my calls and visiting with people are our, our kids and what's going to happen with our 4-H and FFA um, projects. Some of them are starting to, you know, already get their animals and start their, their SAEs for FFA. And as you know, we're, <laughs> our, one of our sons has definitely been very, very highly involved in FFA. So I think that the kids and their parents are starting to question what's going to happen moving forward. Well, I can just tell you, you know, I, I, I have my list right here and I'm going to look at it real closely here for a second. So at this time, you know, we would have, we have uh, many fairs that would have already happened in California. Uh, we would have had our first one is the Colorado River Fair down in Blythe. And that was March 12th through the 15th, and that fair was canceled. Uh, we would have had the uh, San Bernardino National Orange Show, and that is scheduled for April uh, 22nd through the 26th, and that's been canceled. The Santa Maria Valley Strawberry Festival, uh, so there you're getting into Santa Maria, it's canceled. The Merced Spring Fair, so you're moving up to state, it's canceled. Uh, the Santa Barbara Fair and Expo in Santa Barbara is canceled. Uh, getting into your district, the uh, Tehama District Fair, which was <laughs> April 30th, has been canceled. Uh, the president or the, or the uh, chairman of the California Fair Alliance, which is a subsidiary of Western Fairs, her fair, uh, Pat Conklin, uh, was in Dixon on May 7th through the 10th. It's been canceled. Um, the Schools Agriculture and Nutrition Fair in Walnut, California is canceled. Uh, the Porterville Fair is canceled. Calaveras, the Jumping Frog Jubilee, uh, another great friend of, of fairs in California, that's his home fair. And that, that fair is canceled. Um, the Chowchilla Madera Fair, the Contra Costa County Fair, the Glynn County Fair, and then just last night at their board meeting, the Salinas Valley Fair. So we're all the way up to May 17th on fairs being canceled. Uh, the San Mateo County Fair in San Mateo is canceled and they're canceled because they're under a 90 day contract uh, down there in the Sacramento Bay area. I mean, the San Francisco Bay area, uh, they're in a contract to be a, a hospital in their community for wow. at least 90 days. So they know that their fair's out of luck because they're, nine, they're less than 90 days out. Uh, two later fairs, uh, the San Joaquin County Fair and the Redwood Acres Fair over in Eureka have already canceled. So we're talking truly, you know, we're a three, a three billion dollar a year business fairs for the state of California. They generate over three billion dollars in economic in, uh, income per year and and millions and millions of dollars of uh, uh, hundreds of millions actually in tax revenue. And really with this COVID-19 uh, situation, fairgrounds across the state are shut down. There is no interim events running at this time. And the, and the, the, the loss of revenue is mounting daily. Are so, any of those fairs considering doing like um, video auctions for... So, so that's what, you know, you would ask that question and I was just giving you the rundown of all the fairs that are canceled. I think in every single situation, they are working with their junior livestock exhibitors mm -hmm. to have uh, even, even video shows, some of them, where you, they have videoed the animals, they have a judge actually judge the videos, they pick the normal champions, then they're doing online uh, sales, but there's, Right now, the California Rules Committee, which is 
how we govern, or govern the state rules. So we have a, a whole, uh, in, when you get an exhibitor handbook for fairs in California, there's a whole section in the front that are the state rules. And that just ensures that because it is a competitive exhibit, we want to make sure people follow the rules and there isn't any cheating. And, you know, and, and it, it's just come to that where, you know, you have rules for everything. So it's just like if you're playing soccer or you're playing baseball, there's rules. So in the, in the competitive exhibit, there's also rules. And that includes entry deadlines, how old or how young an animal can be, what they have to weigh, uh, the fact that they have to be market ready and all those things. So they are, they've all worked out many different plans. The state of California actually through the state rules committee has just put together some guidelines so that everybody, they've, some people have already done it and we've used some of their templates, but we've come together and made a, a document that will, uh, the, you know, kind of give some facts on what we think would work best. And of course it also protects the state protects the buyer, protects the exhibitor. There will be, you know, some release forms and whatnot you have to, to sign to be in the process, but you know, it's, that's the way it is in life. Well, but yes, we are. we're really working hard to come up with a plan to help everybody. And of course, we want to make sure that we help our kids. Well, I'm very <laughs> thankful to hear that, that you are very involved in that. So well, I've just been on that committee, you know, that committee is, is led by uh, uh, Jay, who's at the California State Fair. And of course, Pat Conklin is on CFA. She's the chair of CFA, but she's also the chair of the Rules Committee. Uh, she's at Dixon and, and God bless Pat. She has uh, put in 30 years in the fair industry. She's had a couple of really rough years there in Dixon and she wanted to retire last year and we talked her out of it. And now she's in the middle of the COVID-19 thing and she had to cancel her fair last week. So. You know, it's after such a long and uh, really giving and service-oriented career, we wish her all the best. Absolutely. Well, Cliff, thank you so much for joining us today and for, for some very helpful and informative conversation. I want to turn it back over to you if you have any final comments or let us know how we can follow your fair and what's happening there. Well, I can just tell you that on behalf of the entire California Fair Network, that I just, I hope that people remember that, you know, we're, we have been really in a semi-crisis situation since 2011. And really, this is really devastating for us as much as it is for all those small businesses and the folks that are out there in the, in the state of California trying to make a living and to be productive and we are still here to promote agriculture. We're still here to promote education. And we do that during our annual fair and with many other interim events that we have, but we are also an economic engine in California. And really in this time, we are going to need some help. And uh, I just, I, I know that everybody loves their county fairs, especially in rural areas. And I just thank you, uh, Megan, for reaching out today and, um, I'm sorry I don't use Assemblywoman Dally. I, I should be more, <laughs> more formal, but no. um, we've, we've known each other a long time. Yeah. So uh, I would just say that, you know, uh, thank you. And really in, in this unknowing time, I just hope that, you know, uh, there's folks like yourself that remember fairs, uh, especially those of you in the, in the legislature. And, and uh, as we divvy up the pot of, of emergency funds, whatever those are, that you guys remember fairs. So I appreciate that. And, and we're here to help, you know, the state in any situation. Um, and we just hope that now that we're going to need some emergency support that um, we can get that. It would be sad to have to lock the doors. Absolutely. Well, thank you for your time today. And I just, you know, I personally appreciate you so much. And for as far as from my staff and my team and I, we are just, we're doing our best to, per, to get information to our constituents and to our community members. We just want you to stay home, stay safe. God bless you. And we will be back soon in Sacramento to, to get the state back on track. So 
Thank you again. You can go to my website. There'll be a series of these videos that you can follow. So thank you, Cliff, for your time and just have a great day. Well, thank you, Megan, and uh, God bless all of you. It's a happy Good Friday here that we're doing this, and uh, you just have to remember what the reason we're all here for. So that's, that's wonderful. Thank you. Have thank a great you. day. You too.